situation. Secondly, it doesn't work there either. If you want to guarantee that the bomb's going off, torture the guy that knows where it is if you happen to uh, have that. Uh, I would also say uh, something else in terms of uh, the role of the military. Uh, we take and ask our young parents to give us their sons and daughters. And we have an obligation to return those young men and women. We hope better citizens, better people, give us some great experience. And certainly, if we have a, pro uh, a policy that would allow torture, and we teach these young men and women that it's OK, we have not fulfilled that rather sacred obligation for us as military uh, commanders. So we believe that the Commander-in-Chief, whoever that will be, should uh, immediately state very clearly that torture is out under all circumstances and uh, so that there's no issue about interpretation of where we stand as a nation and uh, our young soldiers can uh, react accordingly and we can have soldiers who really believe that it's not American, it's against the very values for which they've now stepped up to the plate and served. And uh, so uh, we, uh, we hope that that will be the final outcome, no matter who's elected, and that we have clear guidance, uh, and guidance like Dave Petraeus has uh, put out. Uh, General Petraeus, in a letter, said, some may argue that we would be more effective if we sanctioned torture or other expedient methods to obtain information from the enemy. They would be wrong. And then he goes on to point out one of the, the realities of war. We are indeed warriors. We train to kill our enemies. We are engaged in combat. We must pursue the enemy relentlessly, and we must be violent at times. What sets, it, sets us apart from our enemies in this fight, however, is how we behave. In everything we do, we must observe the standards and values that dictate that we treat non-combatants and detainees with dignity and respect. And he's got more points in it. So our military commanders, our current mili military commanders, recognize the importance of this. And so uh, I thank you all for coming, and I have a special thanks to uh, Human Rights First, as, as uh, Bud McFarland has pointed out, uh, without their organizational ability, without their focus, uh, I would say that it's fair, my colleagues would agree, uh, we would, probably wouldn't be here today. But working with them as we have now for a couple of years, we recognize uh, the importance of what an organization like that does. And as Bud said, uh, Human Rights First has uh, no peers. So thank you very much. Gerald Nash, uh, would you share a few thoughts with us? Thank you, Alyssa, and thanks to Human Rights First, you, Michael, and all the folks that do the work to, to get us here. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I also especially appreciate the opportunity to talk today. Normally, folks, I'm just a pretty face that they bring along for this. Uh, <laughs> uh, but today I get, I get to say a few words. Uh, and it's a privilege for me to join my colleagues here today uh, to discuss an issue of great importance, uh, the promulgation of which was first done by George W., George Washington, who directed that the Continental Army would treat its prisoners, British and Hessian and all, in proper way, because it would be to the advantage of the Continental Army to do so. I'm also uh, happy to be here today because I'm back in Minnesota, the home of one of the greatest generals in history, of the United States, a fellow named Jack Vesey, and I spoke to General Vesey up in Crow Wing County today, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He would also tell you, formerly uh, sergeant of uh, our artillery in the Minnesota National Guard in North Africa many years ago. General Vesey sends you his greetings uh, and is one who has uh, stood by this group and led this group, if not physically, certainly morally, uh, in our pursuit of, of these common interests. Uh, We've heard so far about torture being wrong. Uh, we've heard it, uh, it doesn't work. It harms the reputation 
and the welfare of the United States. Uh, we've talked somewhat about the soldier, but that's the part I want to talk about. Because the use of torture by the United States endangers the soldiers. So if you want to support the troops, then don't allow them to be endangered by our country allowing the use of torture. And it endangers our soldiers in several ways. Uh, it makes the reciprocal action more likely. Now, I can't tell you that our soldiers won't be uh, tortured if we don't torture. But I can guarantee you our soldiers will be tortured if we torture. Second of all, a reputation of an army that tortures, or a nation that tortures, caused increased resistance by enemy forces that our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines are trying to overcome. Because if they believe they are going to be tortured if captured, then they choose to fight to the death, which endangers and undoubtedly will bring about greater deaths of American soldiers, sailors, and airmen, and marines. So the reputation of being a nature of torture, and it doesn't matter if the nation that tortures, the individual that, that tortures on behalf of a nation is wearing a uniform or a suit, okay, or a pair of blue jeans. It's the United States. It's not an agency. It's the United States, and we must understand that. And the third reason has somewhat been talked about, but I want to emphasize it. It also endangers our soldiers when they come home in two aspects. And the first aspect is, is that they bring it back in their mind, and they have to live with the consequences of having participated in such abhorrent uh, manner to behave in such an abhorrent manner, and that will twist on their conscience for the rest of their lives. And we have too much evidence of that uh, today. And the second thing 